Welcome to Dairy Australia's webinar on preventing facial eczema outbreaks. Before I introduce our first speaker, I'd like to encourage you to participate throughout this presentation. We will have a number of audience polls where you can respond via your keyboard and you can also ask questions at any time by typing into the message box that's located at the bottom left hand side of your screen. Also note that today's webinar is being recorded for viewing later and it will be put up onto the Dairy Australia website. If you experience any technical difficulties, please contact Redback Conferencing using the 1800 number displayed on the screen and in the webinar confirmation email that you receive. So today we're covering quite a bit of uh, ground. Uh, we'll be discussing briefly the history of facial eczema. Then we'll move on to a presentation around what does it look like in dairy animals. Then we're going to move on to what are the causes of facial eczema. Uh, we'll touch on how to predict when a pasture could become toxic. And we'll also introduce you to Dairy Australia's four monitoring programs. And then towards the end, we'll move on to the control and prevention strategies. So this is uh, a lot of emphasis on the use of zinc, both in the milking herd and in other classes of stock on the farm. And we'll also be mentioning the things that we don't know about this disease. So before we begin, I've just got a quick uh, poll for you to complete. Are you able to let us know um, what's your role in the dairy industry? Excellent. Seems we've got a range of uh, people involved here. So I think we can close the poll off now, please. And I've also got a second question to follow up. Uh, we're interested in knowing uh, what sort of experience you've had around this disease. So we'll have the second poll question, please. Thank you for sharing all that. Um, we'll close the poll off now and I'd like to now introduce our first speaker. Dr Jacob Melmo is a renowned cattle specialist, veterinarian based at the Mafra Veterinary Centre. He also owns two large dairy farms in the McAllister Irrigation District. Jacob has a long-standing interest in the management of facial eczema and has coordinated the Dairy Australia Pastures Fall Monitoring Program in Gippsland since 2001. So now I'll just move on to this brief history of facial eczema. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, thank you, Catherine, and uh, hello, everyone. Facial eczema is not a new disease. Um, as we have on the screen, first seen in New Zealand in 1897, but the cause was not actually known until 1958. We also note that most of the research on facial eczema that has been done in the world has been done in New Zealand because that's the important, that's where it happens. First recognised in sheep in Gippsland in 1956, where we lost a lot of sheep. In the mid 70s, I think about 1974, facial eczema struck the McAllister Irrigation for the first time. First time I as a veterinarian had seen it and it was a, a, a hell on wheels for that first time. We didn't know much about it, we've learned a lot since. Since that time we've had recurring outbreaks at irregular intervals um, in the McAllister Irrigation District and outside. But more recently we have seen outbreaks in other parts of Gippsland, uh, in northern Victoria and uh, in now in the Bega Valley. So our next poll question Poll question three, if we could, please. OK. 
okay. I think that gives the fair thank you very much for sharing that, a good indication. Um, some people have seen a lot, um, many have seen some, and some have not seen it, and they might be regarded perhaps as lucky. Okay, so if we can now move on, we now move on then to the signs of facial eczema in dairy cattle. In the outbreak in 1974, the first thing I saw was a few cows, as in the photograph there, with uh, red water here in the area. Well, and didn't know what caused it. There'd been a drop in milk production, but a few days later, we started seeing cows with severe photosensitization and severe sunburn. Um, the, sun, the photosensitization is the most obvious sign of the disease. Although as Steve will stress later, it really is a liver disease and sunburn is just part thereof. We see it some two weeks after uh, the toxins start to occur and in, a, in a big way. So because it occurs two weeks after they're exposed to toxin, that's why later we place so much emphasis on attempting to predict when the disease is going to occur. The photograph on the screen, that's a, um, a sunburned area uh, of the third eyelid. What I'm showing there, that, that should look like that should be all that colour. Here we have that, that sunburn going, going on. Um, that's the important part on, on the cow's teats. Most obviously, the, uh, the, the sunburn is on the outside of the teats. The inside isn't facing the sun, and you do not get the same degree of burning there. Here is a vulva of a cow I saw very recently. Again, severely red and swollen. This is a more extreme case. Those teats are extremely hard, swollen, and very red. On the right, less severe with the initial burning that occurs in the udder. Um, then moving along further, this is a cow, if you look closely, and you certainly can see it in a live animal, the black, the black hair, quite shiny, flat, whereas the, um, the white hair, the hair standing on end, and if you feel that skin, it is quite swollen and hard. Um, and these animals, are, if you've got sunburned teats, are in now severe pain. This cow was presented, I was called out to a cow that was down, kicking her abdomen, the farmer thought she had a, 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 a twisted bowel. But when you look, she has severely sunburned teeth. This is a very acute case. Even less severe cases than this are very difficult or nearly impossible to milk. The teeth get very sore, and in many cases, cows have to be dried off purely because of the sore teeth. Later stages, the skin won't like you. If you get sunburned like I do, the skin starts to peel off, and these are not a very pretty sight. This cow, the farmer had done the right thing. He placed the cows in a paddock with plenty of shade. There were a number of cows looking like this. The only problem was the shady paddock was right next to a main road, and so we suggested he move them out of there very quickly. He was doing the right thing, but people were saying, what's going on with the welfare of these animals. Um, okay, so we stress not a skin disease. Of the animals that are affected, uh, only about one in ten will show those signs of sunburn. Very few in my very few cows in my experience die at the time, but some of them in the following calving period, the stress seems to overrule them and a few die at that stage. It's more a disease of lost production rather than a disease of um, uh, rather a disease of um, uh, of death. Okay, so uh, the next poll question, if we could, please, as we've said, a farmer calls you. He says, uh, "What which would you can use to confirm facial eczema?" So give us your marks on that one. Okay, that's about fine. So my comments, um, skin lesions, as Steve will mention later, can be photosensitization due to other causes. Um, this, the combination of gamma GTs and spore counts, don't wait for the red urine. That occurs, but occurs very, very infrequently. And when I see that, I think, gee whiz, we are going to be in for some problems here. 
So at this stage, I'd now like to introduce Steve Little, um, and I very effectively lost his bio, but that's okay. Steve was initially a president of the, um, he's a, he's a past president of the Australian Association of Ruminant Nutritionists. Over the past 30 years, he's delivered many research, development, extension, and education projects for the dairy industry. He led the working group that produced the review of facial eczema, which is now published, and has contributed to the Dairy Australia facial eczema monitoring and extension activity since 2011. Over to you, Steve. Thanks, Jacob. Uh, hi, everybody. Okay, so we're going to we're going to talk now about what causes facial eczema. Um, and probably just before we do that, one important point to make is that uh, just because we see photosensitization does not automatically mean it is facial eczema. And it, uh, you know, it very much depends on the timing as much as anything else. Um, you know, we, we see facial eczema typically in late summer and autumn. Um, but if we were to see photosensitization in spring, we'd probably be thinking of um, spring eczema. Uh, and that's where cows are grazing large amounts of a lush pasture or perhaps an oat or a millet crop that contains a lot of chlorophyll. So that's what we call a primary um, photosensitization, whereas facial eczema is secondary to liver damage. So let's, uh, let's expand on that, uh, that story. OK, so um, the toxin sporodesmin, which comes from a, a, a fungus in the, in the pasture, uh, is ingested by the cow and it gets absorbed and carried to the liver. And when it gets to the liver, it, it generates free radicals which damage the, the cell membranes. Um, and it's particularly concentrated in the, in the bile ducts of the liver. So those, the, those mucosal surfaces of the bile ducts get very damaged. Um, and that leads to thickening of the bile ducts. And ultimately, uh, they are they're, they're, they're entirely blocked. Now you can see you can see in this photo here. See these um, white uh, circles here. These are uh, very thickened uh, bile ducts that have been um, damaged by by the by the toxin. So once once the ducts are blocked, um, it means that uh, phyloetherin, which is just a normal breakdown product of chlorophyll in the rumen. It means that phyloetherin isn't able to be excreted in the bile. So it, it builds up and it spills over into the blood and circulates around the body. And in the skin, the circulating phyloetherin re, re, reacts with sunlight and causes photosensitization, particularly on those areas of skin where there isn't much or any pigmentation, as Jacob showed us. And ultimately, down the track, uh, after there's been a lot of uh, damage and fibrosis to the liver, it, it, it takes on the shape of a, um, a, 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 boxing, a boxing glove. OK, so that's the process. Um, now, this is a very nice little uh, uh, image of uh, the bile ducts in, in two livers. You see the one on the left is perfectly normal, um, looks similar to the air duct system in a set of lungs, really. Um, you've got your major, your major ducts, and then it branches out into the peripheral areas of the uh, lobes of, of the liver. But this uh, liver on the right is heavily damaged. So you can see the gross thickening of the ducts. And you can see all these black areas where the, the smaller ducts have been completely, completely blocked. So uh, getting back to that poll question we asked a little while ago, if you'd answered uh, GGT, you probably would have been most correct. Because if we're going to uh, absolutely, beyond reasonable doubt, um, confirm our diagnosis of facial eczema, uh, we, we do a blood test. And we measure the enzyme gamma glutamyl transferase. Because this one is, uh, is related to the degree of bile duct damage in the liver. And it, typically elevates two or three weeks after the cow's been exposed to the, to the toxin. And then the, the levels gradually decay or drop, drop over a period of weeks when the toxin is, ceases to be um, ingested by the cow. But they can stay up for quite a long time. Um, now, there are other diseases 
say like liver fluke that damage liver tissue and can also elevate G blood GGT levels, but not to the extent that uh, facial eczema does. So what, what sort of levels are we, um, do we need to sort of give us a good indication of the degree of liver damage? Well, you can see in this table that uh, you know, 30 to 70 international units per litre is, really doesn't say, say, tell us much at all. Uh, but once we get between 70 and 300 international units, we'd say that's mild damage. Once we move up to 300 to 700, that's moderate level of damage. Uh, and then um, uh, severe is anything over 700 international units per litre. So here's a, here's a photo of the offending fungus. Uh, it's called Pithomyces shatarum. And you can see these little uh, hand grenade shaped spores uh, that are hanging off this mycelia here. They're, they're characteristic of uh, the facial eczema, the facial eczema uh, fungus. And they're found in decaying plant matter, the soil, the air. They're, they're basically everywhere. But they, they, they like living in decaying plant material. Uh, and whilst they were originally adapted for tropical areas, they've really found their way into temperate areas right around the world, um, including New Zealand, Australia, and um, South American dairy production areas. Now, the, the final point about, about this disease is that these spores are um, heavily concentrated uh, in the, um, the, uh, the base of the pasture sward of uh, perennial ryegrass. So perennial ryegrass has got a lot of dead material, accumulates a lot of dead material uh, underneath it. And this is what the fungus loves. Um, other pasture types like clover, kikuyu, pespalum, tall fescue, uh, you know, they're much safer than ryegrass dominant ones. And I guess the other point to be made here too is that um, we shouldn't assume that every, uh, every spore from this fungus is toxic. Um, there are some that are not toxic at all. Um, there was a study done in the late 90s that showed that the, the found that the proportion of um, fungi that Pithomyces chitarum fungi that are toxic in New Zealand was very high. 86% uh, were toxic in Australia. It was 67%. In Uruguay, it was only 28%. So um, the degree of toxicity does vary from place place to place. All right, so uh, I'll hand back to you now, Jacob. Uh, thank you, Steve. The reason that we want to predict pasture toxicity is very important. The reason is that by the time we see the signs of sunburn, the, the damage was done 10 to 14 days ago. So we need to be able to predict when the spore counts and the toxin that they're ingesting starts to increase so we can take our preventative measures before the damage is done. We know the conditions under which the spores will multiply. Um, they need a minimum night temperature above 12 degrees centigrade for Celsius for, Celsius for um, at least four nights. And they need high humidity. So the current situation in which we're involved, at least in the MID, is very dry. The less likely we'll get multiplication. If you get a couple of repetitions of the combination of warm nights and high humidity, the spores can increase very rapidly. The first period allows the spores to build up a base level and then they multiply higher in the very second period. That's great in theory, but for many years we attempted to predict uh, based on weather conditions when we were going to have trouble and we in most cases failed dismally, as did the New Zealanders. So we've come to the stage whereby we realise and implement counting of the spores on pasture on a regular basis. Don't take that by itself. Also take into account the uh, weather conditions at that time. The other very important point to remember is that spore counts can vary dramatically, uh, dramatically between different paddocks on the same farm, certainly between different farms in the same, in the same area. So to try and give us a better idea of what was happening with respect to the risk of facial excellence, Dairy Australia and Gips Dairy, 
established the facial eczema central farm monitoring program. We start monitoring early, early in January and run through until late autumn, depending on the climatic conditions. On the sentinel farms, the, um, uh, the, 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 the farmers uh, collect samples from two, two paddocks each week, uh, each fortnight initially, and if the counts start to rise, we try and get them in weekly. The farmers are immediately notified of their results, but the spore count results are posted on the Dairy Australia website, so you can readily look up what we, uh, you know, what's available, in, well, what the spore counts are in any particular area. So we can move into the next poll question. Um, here's our poll question. Have you subscribed to the uh, Dairy, Facial Eczema, uh, Dairy Australia Facial Eczema Alert Service? Okay, that's pleasing that there are a good number have enrolled, but there are also a significant number that have not, and it would certainly would be worthwhile considering enrolling in, in, into that into that service. Okay, is that to finish the, the poll? Thank you. We'll move on. The Sentinel Farms. We, initially, we started with Sentinel Farms in the McAllister Irrigation District, Yarram. West Gippsland and South Gippsland. But last year there was a severe outbreak of facial eczema in Bega, so they have also been included in the Sentinel program. The spore counting is performed uh, by veterinary practices in each of these areas. And the reason we've included veterinary practices in each area is we're building the capability so more area, more people are able to carry out spore counting if and when it should be required. So um, this is the, the results are entered into the Dairy Australia website and if you go into the website and look under uh, animal health you'll see facial eczema monitoring and you can look at the spore counts for any particular area. Here we have the, uh, the Ben Warden graph from uh, uh, a week or so ago, uh, counts up to 10,000. Uh, this was a farm which, in fact, last year, the uh, dry farm had massively high spore counts. So the, the, we all watch that, far, that particular farm fairly closely. So what do we do? If the spore counts are starting to trend above 20,000 per gram of pasture, that's not just one, but a number of them, and the weather conditions, that is, is moisture and warmth, we send out a warning to farmers by email, by SMS, Gips Dairy has direct media and communications to get the message out to our farming community that they need to start taking steps to control or think of controlling facial eczema. As we've mentioned, farmers and advisors can sign up for the, uh, the facial eczema monitoring e newsletter, and there's the website address is given for you, for you there. We need to remember that the spore counts are only a guide. If the spore counts trend 20,000 and above, in a number of farms we suggest that each farm could consider monitoring their own spore counts on a week to week basis. Suggestion, they should choose about four, farm, four paddocks on their farm, representative paddocks, and if they see the counts trending up to 30,000, they need to start considering implementation of preventative strategies. Some farmers don't go through this task of monitoring their paddocks. They simply start this as an indication to start adding things to the diet for the ration of their dairy cattle, as Steve will discuss shortly. The veterinary, for farmers not involved in the project, um, the veterinary practices charge approximately $40 per, per spore count to get the results done. This next slide shows results from last, <coughs> last year in the MID. We started to get concerned and by the 11th of January the spore counts were starting to rise. Now this is the week beginning the 11th of January, so uh, you get that on the 18th. 
And at this stage, we sent out our first warning saying, hey, spore counts are rising and start taking the, the previous steps we have mentioned. I believe in this particular year we got in at the right time, just about the right time. Uh, subsequently, we saw the number of outbreaks of facial eczema on farms that had not taken any step to control. But those who had taken control measures such as adding zinc at the time we indicated ran into, minim ran into minimal problems. Um, so that's basically the spore monitoring program and how we've run with it. So the next poll question, when did you last, for the poll, when did you last look at the Dairy Australia website? Okay, so a good number are using that website. Again, for anyone in an area where facial eczema is of concern, uh, that, that, that's something worth looking at on a very regular basis. So if I could now hand back to you, Steve, thank you, to discuss the control and prevention strategies for facial eczema. Thanks, Jacob. <clears throat> okay, so um, as you're aware, there's, there's several options for controlling facial eczema. Uh, and these are detailed in that uh, review of facial eczema booklet, which you can access um, after the webinar. So there's, there's really four main options uh, available to us. Firstly, uh, to, we can avoid the toxin through pasture management. Uh, secondly, we can suppress the toxin using pasture fungicides early on in the piece before the um, spore counts start to rise. Thirdly, we can protect the animal if toxin does happen to be ingested um, using zinc. And fourthly, we can actually breed cows that are more facial eczema tolerant. Now, I'm not going to talk about the second and the fourth options because pasture fungicide, there are no, there are no um, pasture fungicides registered for use in Australia as there are in New Zealand. So that one's irrelevant to us. And similarly, um, uh, we don't have any um, genetics um, with high facial eczema tolerance um, available to farmers in Australia either as they do in New Zealand. So we'll focus on the other two. So firstly, avoiding the toxin, and there's really two aspects to this. Uh, we can reduce the number of spores that are in the pasture in the first place, and that really is a function of um, man managing the pasture grazing pre and post grazing heights carefully through spring and summer uh, to, to minimise the amount of uh, dead litter in, at the base of the sward and, and trying to keep the pasture alive as, possible, as long as we can in, into the summer and keeping it healthy and free from pests and diseases. So that's the first aspect. And the other one is to um, uh, reduce the, the, the intake of spores by the cows. And probably the, the biggest thing here is to really be careful about the, the keeping the residuals high. And we typically talk about trying to avoid grazing below four centimetres, where we're going to uh, we're going to get into this uh, layer of the sward, where we're going to have the highest uh, spore spore counts. And I guess the the other obvious. Uh, strategy to reduce spore intakes is, is to limit the amount of pasture that we give the cows access to and replace, replace high-risk pasture with lower-risk uh, forage crop or a supplement like hay or silage or grain and concentrates. And if you like, yeah, just reduce the, the, the proportion of the diet that is potentially high-risk for, for facial eczema. Now, uh, but what we're really going to spend most of our time talking about now is um, using zinc. Now, zinc is um, protective for um, facial eczema because it actually uh, binds up with with uh, with uh, the toxin sporodesmin, and and it inhibits the sporodesmin from um, producing those free radicals and causing the damage to the bile the bile ducts. Now, um, I've got a photo here of. Um, Gladys, Gladys Reed, she's uh, rather famous in New Zealand. She was given an OBE um, before she died. Uh, she's, um, she, was a, uh, she died at 92 in 2008. She was a dental nurse and, and a farmer uh, 
in New Zealand and uh, she was an avid, uh, I suppose you'd call her an amateur scientist, uh, well before the days of Google and the internet. Um, you know, she was reading scientific papers madly and uh, in 1948 she'd suffered some heavy losses uh, on her farm to uh, facial eczema. 1959 she discovered some information that suggested that zinc um, had some sort of um, protective effect and she trialled this on her own farm and, and a neighbouring farm and uh, ultimately and, and saw some benefit. Initially she thought it uh, that she was actually treating a zinc deficiency, but in fact later on uh, learned that this was all really about um, zinc having a protective um, effect. And, uh, and it was up to the scientists then to sort of uh, pro prove this beyond, beyond doubt. And ultimately, I think in the early 80s, 1981 in New Zealand, zinc was um, officially recommended as, as a treatment for facial eczema, but uh, Gladys had been playing with this for many years before before that. Now as you can see from this trial here that clearly that uh, adding zinc to the toxin gives much lower GGT levels. Okay, So the blue bars here remain quite low over time whereas the green ones um, go up quite dramatically. So our aim when we're supplementing zinc by whatever means is to maintain a protective uh, blood uh, serum zinc level at between 20 and 30, uh, 20 and 35 millimoles per litre. Alrighty, so how, how can we do it? Well, the first, the first option, which is used quite widely in New Zealand, is to add, um, add zinc sulphate to drinking water via some sort of um, proportional device or, or some other means. Um, and uh, you know, there, there are two different types of mag, uh, zinc sulfate that can be used. Um, but the problem is it can be very difficult to achieve the, the target blood, blood zinc levels um, for a number of reasons. Um, a lot of it's to do with just uh, the daily water intakes of cows. They, they vary considerably with weather conditions um, and they vary between animals as well. Um, and of course, if there are alternative water sources that the cows can get hold of, like dams and streams and puddles, uh, that can um, sort of uh, derail the whole process as well. So really, uh, probably the view is that zinc sulfate through water should only be used uh, for low challenge periods, and it's probably not, not sufficient to, um, to, for, for high, high challenge periods. So now we move on to zinc oxide which can be given either by via a drench, a rumen bolus or in the feed. Um, so we'll talk about the drench first. Again, commonly used in New Zealand. Um, so we'll talk about the drench first. Again, commonly used in New Zealand. And, one of the, and it needs to be done daily or every second day. If we stretch out the administrations beyond that then we leave the, 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 the cow's blood zinc levels fall into a trough between each uh, dosing. Um, one of the difficulties with drenching cows with zinc oxide is um, that you know, the, the variation in body weight of cows in a herd and, and there's some good New Zealand data to show that uh, you know, some of those um, larger cows can not achieve those recommended blood levels if we don't adjust the dose for um, different, different sized cows. The boluses we're not going to talk about because there aren't any, unfortunately, there aren't any registered products available that we can use in, in Australia. So let's move straight on to administering zinc via the, via the feed. Um, there's three, three, three main options really. We can, uh, farmers can um, have uh, the feed company uh, mix the, the zinc oxide in a, in a pelleted feed or uh, mix uh, a zinc oxide premix in grain or a grain mix, or the farmer can uh, do this um, themselves on on farm using a mixer or a, or a mineral dispenser. Okay, so I guess there's two two things we need to two two concerns we've got with um, with uh, supplementing with zinc oxide via feed is that we can one risk is that we underdose cows. And if we don't if we don't get their blood levels up to the required 
level, then we run the risk that some of the sporodesm toxin that they might ingest will not be deactivated by the by the zinc, and they can still suffer suffer from it. Conversely, uh, we can over overdose. Um, sorry, before I before I go on there, though, you know, I guess uh, one of the myths. One of the myths that I think, uh, or one of the practices that um, we're, we're very much trying to discourage, um, is the use of half dosing with zinc oxide. I mean, you either you either you either do it or you don't. There's no half measures. So um, again, we come back to we're aiming to get that blood level up to the 20 to 35 uh, micrograms, and that's uh, there's you know there's Half doses are really uh, not on. When it comes to overdosing, um, I guess one of the other myths or perhaps um, misunderstandings in the in the industry has been that there's some sort of maximum safe period for zinc supplementation, and that you should never go over a certain uh, number of days, be it 60, 80, or 100 days. But look, the, the reality is there is no such um, maximum safe number of days. Um, you know, the 40 years of of uh, administering zinc in New Zealand tells us that if um, you know if we if we if we get this right and we get the dosage rate right, then um, you know we can we can go beyond 100 days without any problems. But nevertheless, it is a risk. Um, what what are the changes that we see in cows that have zinc toxicity? Well, it it affects many of their organs, but particularly their um, uh, abomasum, their kidney, their pancreas. So there's some characteristic um, uh, presentation that you see. Jacob might want to comment on this later, maybe uh, that you see in a cows that have zinc toxicity. But really, the first thing we should do if we're worried about that is to do some blood zincs and maybe some serum amylases just to see where they where they sit. But I guess the main point I want to make is that really the risk of underdosing is far greater than the risk of overdosing. And in fact, if you look at um, some studies that have been done in Australia and uh, New Zealand um, in recent years, you'll see uh, uh, some herds are, are underdoing it, some herds are overdoing it, some herds are getting it pretty much right. Um, so here we have three three Australian Farms, which we um, we looked at uh, three or four years ago, and you can see the 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 blood serum zinc level we're looking for is 20 to 35 micrograms per litre. So this herd is way down at um, 15 to you know a lot of them under under 20 down at 15. So this herd is underdosing. This herd 20 to 35. This herd's absolutely nailing it. And, and got very good consistency. This is uh, 10, 10 cows from the herd that have been blood tested. And then this third herd, uh, you can see we've got 20 and 35. We've got lots of cows that are well beyond 35, 50, 100. So um, this, this herd's um, overdosing. But the point is that probably a, a lot of cows are, are typically not adequately protected. So we need to, we need to get this right. Um, so what, what factors contribute to variation? Um, there's really three, I think, uh, three main ones. that uh, We either get the, the dose rate calculation wrong um, or we, uh, the cows are presented with inconsistent levels of zinc oxide in, in the feed and consume inconsistent levels. Or thirdly, that um, after the, the, the feed, the dosage has been calculated and the feed's been the, the supplement the feed's been made. Um, we change the daily feeding rate, and that that changes the dosage rate immediately. So, Steve, um, Steve I just want to um, see. We've got a question from Dave in the audience. Sure. Um, he's interested in knowing: is it a problem to give zinc at the recommended doses if there isn't a sporodesmin challenge? Uh, it's. Not a problem. It's it's not a problem. It'd be great to have 20, 20, 20 hindsight. You know, we would say that uh, the the ideal time to start using zinc oxide is three weeks before a challenge. Um, 
but uh, there, no, there's no, there's no, uh, there's no harm in using zinc oxide in the absence of a sporodesmin challenge. Um, it's, you know, it's probably you could argue it's better to it's better to start too early than start too late, because um, you know one point that Jacob and I I think have both made is that um, you know zinc zinc vents um, facial eczema it, it doesn't treat it, and once the liver damage has been done, it can't be um, reversed by by the zinc. So early intervention is cri is critical. So better to be in there a bit early than a bit late. Okay, so um, in the in the review booklet, we we uh, we provided a, a, a little uh, dose calculation table here. This is using zinc oxide, which is 80% elemental zinc, um, and this is a uh, uh, this shows you the the the, uh, the inclusion rates that you need kilos of zinc oxide per ton of feed based on the daily feeding rate per cow from one to ten kilos of grain concentrate. And for cows that weigh between 450 and 750 kilos, so if we're going to get if we're going to get this right with reasonable precision, the two things we've got to absolutely know are our average cow live weight, and 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 we need to have committed to what our grain concentrate feeding rate is going to be per cow per day, whilst that batch of um, Zinc oxide supplemented feed is being fed on the farm. Okay, so I guess the easiest way to work out what the average cow live weight is is to is to weigh ten or twenty uh, animals. Um, uh, you know, kill sheets are a bit of a guide, but they they might give you possibly a bit of a false impression. So that's really important to get that right. And I think as advisors, that's perhaps something we can help farmers with to work that out. Um, and uh, you know, this is a, we've got to during the during the season. If we feel that if farmers feel that they're going to need to adjust their feeding rates um, as pasture availability changes through the summer, well, you know, they might be better to put themselves in a position where they've got you know um, a whole month's worth of feed in a silo with a certain dosage of zinc oxide because that that sort of uh, means they haven't got much room to to move then. Okay, so when it comes to actually um, delivering the, the medicated feed to cows, uh, obviously we've got to make sure the, the zinc's evenly mixed in the feed and that it doesn't um, easily settle out before or during during feeding. Um, we've got to make sure that the, the cows are actually getting what we the, the amount of feed that we think they're getting, um, and we've also you know obviously. We need to make sure there are individual bales for each cow. Um, you know, with open troughs, this becomes very, um, very um, hard to control. Uh, and uh, we need to make sure that the feeding system in the dairy is, um, you know, is well calibrated and is dropping consistent quantities of feed. Uh, if it's a herringbone from one end to the other, particularly. So that's, you know, again, that's something as advisors. You know, it's helping a farmer set themselves up to commence feeding zinc oxide. One thing that's very useful to do is to um, help them um, check their feeding system and make sure it is um, properly. And of course, we also need to know the, the the bulk density of the grain or the grain mix or the pelleted feed that we're using, because you know we're converting from a volumetric allocation of um, feed hour per day into kilos. So that's important to check as well. All right, so I'll hand back to Jacob now, who's going to now talk about. I've talked about prevention dosing of milking cows. Um, now we're going to talk about the more challenging um, issue of crisis dosing other stock on the farm. Thank you, Steve. One of the issues I ran into last year was two groups of pretty big groups of bulls that were totally decimated by facial eczema. And the question is, what can you do about them? But the same question applies to young stock. Uh, one approach um, uh, in New Zealand has been the use of these time boluses, but not available to us here. So crisis dosing is an option, 
that could be considered in the case of severe challenge to young stock, the bulls, dry cows in particular. Um, they could be drenched, and, and, and does he mean drenching, uh, once or twice per week. It doesn't give the same level of protection as does long-term drenching, but, but it is an option if you're running the, you know, if the, if the bulls or the young stock and situations where they're likely to be at great risk. It can also be used to crisis drenching in milking cows, but it doesn't give the same effective protection as does, as does long-term drenching. Secondly, most, virtually none of the farmers in the MID that I know of are now used to drenching their cows daily. Many years ago, on one of my farms, we did drench daily to prevent bloat, but with the big farms now, that would be very, very, very difficult. Cows get trained to it, they get used to it, but I would have to take a lot of convincing any of my clients to do it again. So I think it's got a role for young stock, for bulls and even dry cows in an emergency, but that's all. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Jacob. Okay, so um, just before we finish, it's probably uh, I think important to acknowledge that there's you know there's still quite a few things we we still don't know about facial eczema, uh, even though you know um, dairy industries around the world have been fighting this for several decades now. We 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 still don't know if there's a better method to assess the toxicity of a pasture than doing the spore counts, but really that's that's uh, the best um, means we, we have at this stage. Um, we don't we don't know we don't understand how variable the toxin levels produced by uh, the fungus are from place to place and what factors contribute to the toxin levels. So we can really only uh, really run on the premise that if we um, if we if we're getting spore counts we, we should assume the worst and assume that those spores are, are toxic. And, and act accordingly. Um, we don't know. Yeah, we don't know just how long the uh, sporodesmin levels in the spores persist after sporulation, or in fact, um, how well they survive the, uh, the silage making process and persist in, in silage. Um, uh, it's often a question that, that we're asked. Um, you know, oh well, I've I've bailed that paddock um, instead of letting the cows graze it. Is you know. That silage okay to feed now or in a month's time or whatever? We we just don't have a black and white answer to that, unfortunately. Um, the other the other thing we don't know for sure is well we understand that um, you know GGT blood GGT levels in cows decay or, or re go down over time, but we we really don't know enough about that yet to sort of use that to sort of um, uh, make any uh, prediction as to the prognosis of an affected cow and whether she's likely to to, to uh, recover or not. Um, but we do know that cows that have higher GGT levels are, are, are more likely to um, leave the herd at the beginning of the next lactation than um, cows with lower GGT levels, T levels say below 200 um, international units per litre. Um, yep, we've mentioned that. Um, at what height above ground level is it safe to cut pastures for silage or hay? Well, again, there's no black and white um, answer answer to, to that, but it's you know it's certainly want to be conservative about about that. And we don't know if um, you know if biological control uh, methods where where the, we use competitive exclusion with uh, strains of uh, the fungus that are not toxic is a is a is possibly a a future strategy for controlling and preventing facial eczema. So, um, just acknowledging that there are a few things that we just still um, uh, don't 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 have a grasp of. Steve, we've had a couple of uh, questions from our audience. Uh, Claire's asking, how long does it take for the cow to reach its recommended zinc level in the blood? I assume, and yeah. how long before a blood test would be useful? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's a great that's a great question. Um, uh, well, I, I would say um, I'd say it probably only takes uh, probably a week or two. But our, our general recommendation would be to to do uh, to blood test perhaps three to four weeks after you start using zinc oxide um, as a way of um, seeing whether you're in the sweet spot between the 20 and 35 
micromoles per litre. Um, and in fact, in the, in the review booklet, um, there, there is a, a page there that gives you the details about how to go about doing that. We recommend that you test um, 10 cows in, in a herd um, and, um, and, and uh, look at those results. I guess the unfortunate thing though, Claire, is um, uh, blood, blood zinc uh, analyses uh, are not inexpensive and you, you're going to be looking at several hundred dollars to, um, to, to do that. But look, it, it, it may maybe may well be um, well, well worthwhile. So those details are in the review booklet. Sorry. There's another question from Tim. How should we tackle dosing in a mixed herd where you've got ranges of body weight, say 400 to 650 kilos, uh, with a single feed? Yes, yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, well, I suppose, uh, well, if, if you had a... Uh, a computerised bale feeding system that allowed you to um, differentially feed cows. You could differentially feed them uh, different levels for the heavier cows, the, the, the larger cows versus the smaller cows. So that that would be um, of grain. That would be one way to to, to perhaps um, try and address that. Um, but yeah, that's that's difficult. It's it's the herds that have uh, quite a lot of variation in their cow breeds and body weight that are the most um, the, the most difficult to um, to uh, to deal to get this right. Actually, there's no no magic answer to that, unfortunately. Okay, so. Um, just to just to sum up the the key messages, um, I guess what Jacob and I have, have really I guess tried to emphasise is that um, you know uh, there's a bit of an ice you know we can use the iceberg analogy here that you know only only some cows uh, affected by facial eczema show the obvious signs of photosensitisation. Um, it's probably say for every one that we see there might be eight or ten that um, do not, but that's, it's the cows that are subclinically affected through liver damage. They're the ones that um, result in the, in the severe economic impacts that we see through reduced milk production, fertility, weight gain, and possible uh, death. So, um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's those animals we need to be thinking of. Um, and as Jacob's highlighted, uh, you know, where, Using weather conditions alone does not allow us to reliably predict pasture toxicity, and that's why we really do need to be monitoring pasture spore counts. And the the Dairy Australia Sentinel farms they're, they're really only useful as a guide, and and really 20,000 20, spores per gram should be the trigger for farms to to start monitoring their own paddocks and. Um, and, and uh, moving towards implementing their own um, facial eczema control prevention strategies. Um, now, zinc, as we've said, it's only there, it can only prevent facial eczema. It can't reverse with the damage that's already occurred, and that's why you need to get in there, you know, relatively early and um, intervene and, and and have the cows protected before the before the um, the risk period. Arrives, um, and then the, the final point there is that really, you know, because of the there's a few complexities in achieving the um, the target blood zinc levels that we've talked about, and avoiding underdosing and overdosing. You know, this is really really an exercise where farmers and advisors and feed suppliers really need to work together to um, to get this right for each particular farm. Um, and I think there's lots of ways in which advisors can support farmers in, in that. Um, so a few actions to perhaps uh, after this webinar to consider. Well, firstly would be to, um, if you haven't already, to subscribe to the Dairy Australia's uh, Facial Eczema Alert Service and there's the, the link to, to do that. Um, download the, the review booklet if you don't already have have that and uh, read read through read through that particularly the appendices at the back that you might find helpful. Um, 
keep keep uh, keep going onto the DA web page and and monitoring the uh, spore counts on those sentinel farms, and also have a look if you haven't already. At, uh, we we wrote a two page um, Dairy Australia fact sheet called Preventing Facial Exa and Milking Cows Using Zinc Oxide in Feed, and that uh, that gives you um, a bit of a summary of um, all the issues around that. And on the back, there's quite a useful checklist, um, which you know that might be a, a good discussion starter with um, with your clients as well to, to go through that and say, have we thought about this? Have we got that covered? So uh, yeah, actions to consider with with your clients. Um, you know, Nat, I mean, the, the timing for this webinar is absolutely spot on, isn't it? Because it you know would appear that we we may well be moving into a High risk period in the next sometime in the next uh, few weeks. So now is a good time to help clients prepare to monitor their own paddocks and um, have a look at those sentinel farm spore levels and be ready to to implement strategies if they haven't already. Um, you may well, you know, as we said before, be able to help them work out what their average cow live weights are, um, check the performance of their bale feeding system. So that you know, at least those two variables are, are well and truly covered. Um, you could discuss some of the other strategies to reduce ingestion of spores, and um, if it becomes necessary at any stage, you could discuss um, the options that they have for crisis dosing other stock, which which Jacob which Jacob mentioned. Okay, so I'll hand back to you, Catherine. Okay, we've had a couple of more questions from the audience. Um, Tim was going back to his original question about the mixed uh, live weight herd. Um, yep. Should you overdose the smaller animals to ensure that the larger animals are covered? Oh, <laughs> uh, that's a that's a hard one. Um, the the dose rate the dose rate that we're aiming for is 20 milligrams of elemental zinc per kilo live weight. I'm not sure whether I um, made that crystal clear before. So um, I, I, yeah, we just we've got to be a bit careful. I mean, we need to need to understand that the, the that dose rate is you know it's probably at least 10 times the cow's actual zinc daily zinc requirement, and you know we're we're not we're not that far away away from um, the risk of toxicity, so we, we just need to be uh, a little a little careful. Um, uh, you know, I think I think that that in that sort of a herd where you've got small cows and large cows, that that's that's uh, really the herd where perhaps um, whatever level you decide to pitch at, whether it's slightly above average body weight, whatever it is that. That's the sort of herd where I reckon some blood tests uh, three or four weeks after you start might might be a good way of just you know just checking where you're at. Say take five of the smaller cows and five of the larger ones and just see exactly what um, blood um, what blood zinc levels they are sitting at, and then use that to adjust uh, your inclusion rate when you can. Thanks, Steve. Um, we've had another uh, quick question about how to do the spore counts. I think that's a, a question for another day, and we can certainly get back to Dave about that one. And Claire hey, Jason, has asked. Catherine, if Dave likes to email me, I've got the procedure all written out and can email it to him. Perfect. Um, and we've had a question from Claire. Has it been perfect? Um, and we've had a question from Claire. Has it been investigated whether spores survive going through a cow's gut? Can surviving cows inadvertently spread the toxic spore to susceptible ryegrass pastures? Right. Um, I believe the spores, Jacob, the spores will almost certainly survive, I think, going through the, the cow's gut. Um, but I, the spores are pretty widespread. Uh, I'm not too worried. I don't think you'll find too many virgin queen pastures if you've got facial exam in the area. Yeah, Thanks, Jacob. Already there. Mm. Yeah, we're there. Jacob, one good. comment I'd like to make, if I could. You were all earlier, Steve, we're nearly out of time. Is he talking to me? With respect to the question on the high and uh, heavy and light cows, I'm looking for the mid-range. 
because we have to remember that the dose, as you said, the dose rate of zinc that is used to prevent facial eczema is close to the toxic dose. Having said that, I've been about for a long time and we've used a lot of zinc in the air. I've only seen a relatively limited number of confirmed cases of zinc toxicity. And they've nearly always been associated with a problem such as a mistake made in the mixing or feed it in a correct way where it gets bound together and comes down in slugs. I've not really seen it, I don't think, in herds where people have tried to go very close to the right thing. Um, and it is a little less concerned provided you make sure you get the dose as right as you can. And, and, and that the, uh, the feed the cows are consuming has got a con whatever the level is, that it's a consistent um, concentration of zinc from one end of the shed to the other or whatever. This, this is why I mentioned the case I had where it was mixed with grain, the zinc was mixed with grain and they added an agent, a sticky agent to try and make it go throughout the grain. What happened was this stuck on the feeders and then they'd come down in big lumps of concentrated zinc oxide. We ran into zinc toxicity in that situation where the zinc wasn't appropriately mixed. Well, thank you, Steve and Jacob. We are now out of time. If there are any other further questions, I'm happy to take them by email. You will have my email on the original invitation and I'm sure we'll be able to help you. But I would encourage everyone, before you go, you can download a PDF version of the fact sheet on feeding zinc oxide and you can also get um, an electronic version of the review document. You can see both of those um, in the message box on the left hand side of your screen. So if you haven't got those, suggest you, you download them um, and use them for future reference. So thank you everybody for attending and uh, that's the end of our webinar. Thank you, Gavin.